Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to those who are online. Welcome to those students here as well. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer and then we'll get into our teaching this morning. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you once again for this uh, beautiful day that you have blessed us with, oh God. What a joy and privilege it is for us to come together and to learn and sit at your feet, oh God. And we pray that even as we learn, Holy Spirit, that you will bring insight, you will give us wisdom, you will give us the understanding, and uh, Lord, that everything we learn and uh, will be seeds that are sown in our heart, that you will, Lord, enable us to bear fruit in each of our lives. Oh God, we thank you and we commit this day and all the learning into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last class we briefly looked at the reformation of the evangelist and uh, you know i was going when i went back i thought you know there's so many evangelists you know uh, that we can talk about uh, but yes we did pick up some of the important ones uh, the point of chapter 4 is to understand that uh, there was a reformation meaning where there was a stop god used people great men and women of god to restore the ministry of the evangelist. Now, uh, let's get into the ch fifth chapter, chapter five, practical keys to doing the min ministry of an evangelist. Now, this will be the last portion when it comes to uh, the evangelist. And so after this, we'll get into uh, the ministry of the teacher. So let's look at a, pr a few practical keys to doing the ministry of an evangelist. Now, we've established the fact that you know the gift and the calling that God has given us is something that is irrevocable. God is not going to take it away from us. There's a there's a gift, there's a grace that God gives us, and it is our responsibility to build on that gift and grace, right? So when it comes to practical keys, now remember, God is a supernatural God. But he's also, but he works in practical ways. Yes or no? Right? If you see all through the scriptures, the way he works, he, he he's a supernatural God, but he can also get the supernatural done through practical methods. And so for us as believers, no matter what we're doing, not only as an evangelist, but no matter what we are doing, we must learn to be practical as well. Learn to understand that, hey, I'm living in a world where I have to be practical. Right? Very simple example is uh, if you get sick or if, there's, if you have some kind of sickness, is it wrong to go to the doctors? It's good. Right? But is it, wrong to, uh, is it wrong to not pray? Should we pray? So is it wrong to pray and go to the doctor? No. Right. So we, we know that God is our healer. We know that by the cross, uh, by his stripes, we are healed. Yet we do the practical thing of going to the doctor. Right? Now, both are important. We can't say this is not important and that is not important. Both are important. Right? So what are some of the practical ways that we can build are the gift or the calling of the evangelist. Now, first one, follow the biblical pattern of the evangelist. Now, this is a very important key. Follow the biblical pattern. Very Most often, sometimes what we can do is we can follow people. Now, it's not wrong to learn from people. Right? We can learn the way people are doing ministry. We can learn from other ministries. We can learn from other men and women of God. Right? It's good to learn from them. I personally have learned from a lot of the leaders around me. But it's very important to follow the biblical pattern when it comes to ministry. So we looked at the scriptures in, in the book of Acts, right, where we see the rise of evangelists within the church in Jerusalem and Antioch, and then well, you know people taking up these roles and responsibilities, going out and reaching out and preaching the gospel. Now, I just put down a few points. So what you can do is you can just write it, you know, just maybe uh, 
for each point you can just write you know and you can add to whatever i'm saying but i've just put down a few points right first one is to walk in humility the one of the most important biblical patterns biblical patterns of ministry is humility look at the example of jesus what did he do you know he walked in power yet he walked in humility he spoke red hot scorching words against sin but he loved the sinner right so walking in humility is not a sign of weakness but it is a sign of power and i always say this when you you know when we become leaders and when we grow in in ministry or whatever position that god is giving us as we grow we get we gain power and one of the responsibilities of a leader is to have the power to know when to use the power right so walking in humility look at the example of jesus what a powerful example and i really learned so much from this jesus is tempted he's in the wilderness right the enemy is coming all guns blazing he says only if i can get him to fall for one temptation the cross is of no need if he just falls for one the cross is powerless it, it, even even you know there's no point of the cross because he was fallen for sin but look at jesus he says turn the stone into bread he could have done it but you see that he walked in humility he said no i'm not going to listen to what you're saying i'm not going to you know the enemy you know that i can do it but i don't have to prove it to you i don't have to prove it to you because right after that temptation he goes and changes water into wine right after that the first one right so he doesn't have to he didn't have to prove it and one of the you know when we read the scriptures one aspect that god really loves is humility when we are humble god raises us up right look at moses god brought him to a place of humility he says no i don't want to go god says you are the one you go it's okay i'm there with you look at david david sinned he you know committing adultery in the old testament is a big sin you know now it's common but in the old covenant it's a big sin it's totally against god's word against who god is now you got the king of israel committing adultery and what does he say you know uh, the prophet nathan comes rebukes him did he say hey prophet just to remind you there's a way to tell it to me you know who i am i'm the king of israel i didn't come here just by i won many wars i've killed the lion and the bear if you don't remember i handled goliath as well right so i've done quite a lot of things this is just one small mistake i'll handle it with god who are you to tell speak to me this way did david say that what did he say he said i have made i have sinned he put on sackcloth and ashes and he repented of his sins one of the greatest signs of a leader is humility right and and so it's very important for us as leaders to never lose sight of it always think of what you're doing okay you know especially as a as a minister of god you may be in any of the fivefold ministry and the lord is raising you up all of a sudden you get opportunities all of a sudden people want want you to come they're seeing the gift the grace of god upon your life they are uh, they giving you opportunities you're seeing the work of god in your ministry don't lose sight of who is doing what in your ministry meaning we cannot do anything without the holy spirit right that brings me to the second pattern that we see in the old in the scriptures is to be anointed right to depend on the holy spirit 
what did they in Acts chapter 7? What did they do? They chose seven people full of the Holy Spirit. Right. And we learned last class and in the first years, we learned about you know the, the work of the Holy Spirit. While you know, in lifestyle evangelism, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the unbeliever. What is the role of the Holy Spirit? We are just sharing the gospel, but it is the Holy Spirit who brings conviction. Remember that? Right? That, without the Holy Spirit, what are we doing? It's just presenting the gospel. But it is the Holy Spirit that begins to work in that person's life, you know, convicting them of sin and righteousness. Right? And so even as we minister to people, yes, we preach God's word, we we use God's wisdom, we use our natural words, our natural wisdom to uh, you know, to communicate God's word and the truth of God, uh, who God is. We need to be able to ask God to anoint it. The anointing is what will make the difference. The anointing upon us will make the difference. <clears throat> You get what I'm saying, right? Everyone with me, right? So it could be something very small, very insignificant, right? So, for example, you may be sharing with somebody. You know, yesterday I was visiting of a, a, a family, and this family was going through a lot of difficulties. So when I visited them, uh, you know, they lost a loved one. And I was just ministering to them. Now we know. Right? If somebody loses a close family or a loved one, there's no words that can bring comfort at times. Right? We can say a hundred things, but that person can still feel the same. But if those words that we speak are anointed of God, we say, God, you put the words in my mouth. So what I say should minister to that person. Right? So I, I remember we just opened the Bible. We talked about Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, all of us know this. Now, they've been believers for many, many, many years. And they probably know that whole psalm by heart, right? But we talked about it, right? Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But right now, we are in want. We have many questions. I want to know why this happened to me. Right? He makes me lie down in green pastures. Nothing is green here. You know, when you talk about green pastures, it's a place of rest and enjoyment and peace. Nothing is good here. You know, I lost my job. I lost my uh, a, a loved one in my family. There's no peace at home. There is fear. There is doubt. Everything. But the Bible is saying he makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, this is when uh, the, the psalmist is writing when he is escaping for his own life. It's not when the king, you know, David is sitting on the throne and he's looking at all the gardens in his uh, palace. No, he's in a time running away for his own life. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me to the paths of righteousness. Right? So we went through that whole psalm. And after that psalm, after this spending some time in it, there was so much of peace, not only for... You know, they they shared that you know there was so much of peace, but even for me personally, I felt so much of peace. Now, have I read this psalm? I don't know how many times, uh, but just going over that word again, the anointing of the Holy Spirit has used that word to minister to both both of them and to me. Right, and that's what the anointing does. It goes it it, it goes deep into us. And it begins to very powerfully come out. Right? Look at Jesus. When he went out and he did his ministry, what, is he, what, what does it say? He says he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. So anointed that even when he went, the demons were fleeing from him. Demons are saying, why, did you, why have you come so early? It's the same anointing of the Holy Spirit that you and I have. And then we grow in that anointing, right? Thirdly, uh, the biblical pattern of an evangelist, we see that in all of this, while doing the works of the ministry, they never lost sight of who God is, meaning holiness. The holiness of God was always, you know, sometimes we, as, as believers, we always focus on the power of God. 
oh god is powerful god is supernatural he's he's you know he can do the things that nobody can do but we forget about the holiness of god right so the first thing that comes to my mind sometimes when we say holy spirit is power right or you know we we think of it that way at times but holy spirit the first thing that should come to our mind is holiness being holy right and so we see this pattern in the book of acts you know b l muri used to spend many many hours 6 to 7 hours praying and he would not pray for life for you know for uh, opportunities to minister to people most of the time in his prayers went on god i want to be holy because god's word says be holy for i am holy right ct stud he prayed the same thing the salvation army william booth right they, the, 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 the emphasis of their ministry of the Salvation Army was holiness. And out of holiness, you know, flow, flowed all the other aspects, right? And so we must remember the biblical pattern. Now, why am I sharing this? Because, you know, in a day and age that we are living in, we can become ministers of God, catch a flight, go to another city, another country. Do ministry, come back, go to another place, do ministry, come back. And it becomes a routine. The moment it becomes a routine, this is one of the ways, one of the primary ways, I would say, where the enemy can inf infiltrate into our lives. Remember the book of Revelations? Jesus is saying to the church in Ephesus, listen, you guys are doing a lot of work. Lots of work you are doing. Everyone know you. You're famous. Everyone know you. Everyone see you. There's a lot of works that you're doing, but you have lost your first love. And we can, it's dangerous because we can come to that place where we say, hey, uh, we're going and doing all these ministries and the things that God wants us to do. But, uh, you know, I don't want to be in a place where Jesus says, Paul, you've lost your first love. You've been teaching and preaching for so many years, but you've lost your first love. I and mean, I don't want to be in that place. So it's very important to come back. Remember, Paul is writing, 1 Corinthians 30, and he's, he's talking about love. He's saying, if you have all these wonderful gifts, if you can speak the mysteries of God, if you have great knowledge and wisdom of God, but if you do not have love, you're just a sounding gong meaning it has no value there are no rewards for this right so even as we do ministry remember this try and follow the biblical not try you must follow the biblical pattern right go back to the word see what the word says hey if i am going somewhere am i going somewhere out of god's word is my living pattern you know, going somewhere against God. Is my thinking pattern going away from God's word? Right? Now, listen, you may have seasons in life, right? You will have seasons in life where you, you know, especially when you're doing something for many, many, many years, it becomes a habit, right? And then you can, the enemy tries to infiltrate that. So we need to be very careful and we need to understand that, hey, if God is calling me for this, I need to go back. I need to follow this biblical pattern. Am I right doctrinally? Am I, am I speaking the right things? Am I ministering the right way? Go back and see him. Right? So it's, it's important that we do that. And of course, you can add many more uh, patterns that we see in the scriptures. The second point is develop the supernatural. The word develop means to to grow in it, right? Just like how our body grows, right? Our organs develop. Now, when you're born, when you're two months old, you know, what is the size of your heart? It's maybe just one small dot, right? And when you're, when you're 50 years old, what is the size of your heart? Obviously, it's grown. 
right? And then uh, look at the other organs. Your body develops, right? Your organs grow, they develop. Now, in the supernatural, we need to develop ourselves in that. Nobody in this world has been born and say, okay, now I can do ministry. Yes, God, remember, see, there are gifts, right? God places in us. But we need to develop that gift. Right? So, for example, you want to be a pastor or an evangelist, right? Now, you know, okay, for that, I need to be able to communicate well. Communication is key. Now you don't want to have a church and then you're, you know, we are, you're preaching or you're teaching. Imagine we can't communicate properly. What will happen? I mean, you're, you're preaching, but nobody's understanding anything. Communication is bad. So but this is just an example, right? So if you are leading a church or you're doing evangelism, you know, hey, I need to learn to communicate well. Now, if I have to learn to communicate well, one of the important areas, one of the ways that I can learn to communicate well is to read. Right Now, I remember when I became a believer, I always say this, right? I would never read books. Books is, I'm, I don't like books. I mean, it's, you know, books is not my thing. I liked all of these indoor games, sorry, outdoor games, playing football. Uh, you know, just going out, cycling, uh, doing all these things outdoor. I was always that way. Then I became a believer. And what did I want to be? I wanted to be, you know, I wanted God to use me in the ministry. So if God should use me in the ministry, what should I do? Pre prepare myself. Okay, so how do I prepare myself? Read Bible. Sorry? Obedience. Okay, no, give me give me some practical things, like how Vimal said, you know, read the Bible. It's a practical thing. Sorry? Stay in prayer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's the spiritual aspect. In the practical, what should I do? So if if so, for example, God has said, Paul, I've called you out. Now I've called you, you're gonna be example a pastor. So now as a pastor, if, if I have to do something, okay, good. Daniel says to be confident. Right? Now, if I want to be, I can't be preaching in front of the mirror all my life. I have to stand in front of the pulpit and stand and preach. No, I can't say church. I'll just sit down here and I'll preach. Uh, you know, it's not going to work. I need to be confident. Okay, what else? Practical things. Okay, okay, start sharing the word of God with people as God leads. What else? Practical. So I'm, so think of it this way. If you want to learn a sport, what are the practical things you'll do? Practice. Yeah. Then, will you sleep 12 hours a day? You, you need to look after your body, right? So will you eat all junk food, whatever you feel like? There are things that there's a diet, there's a way, you know, what to eat, when to eat, how to eat, right? Uh, all of that is there. What else? Hard work, yes. It's a, now, now, if you want to grow in the natural, you have to do all this, right? You have to prepare. So I remember when I became a believer, I didn't want to read the Bible. I would open the Bible and start reading. Maybe one chapter is maximum. After that, it's like boring, yeah. Because I'm not read, right? It's not something that I want to do. I'm not interested in reading. Then I realize, okay, God, if I want to be this, if I want to preach, I have to read this. There's no other way. There's no other option. If I want to grow spiritually, I have to go into this. Now, whether I like it or not, I have to do it. So I had to go back and really get into this. Okay. So what I did was I started very simple. I started reading stories in the Bible, right? So I knew, okay, Daniel is a story. Job is a story. Elijah is a story. Jonah is a story. Moses, all these are stories. 
which is interesting. And surprisingly, I started with Old Testament as a new believer. Right? There were portions where all these names would come. I'll skip it. Okay, then what happened? Right? So just read them. So stories, I was very excited with these. Then I got to know about this man, Apostle Paul. Oh, he did good ministry. So I will start to read about Paul, the Apostle. Then slowly I started getting interested. Then I realized, you know, I used to watch a lot of videos and, uh, uh, you know, during those days there was this um, something like podcasts. So you can uh, tune into radio and you can keep listening to Christian radios, right? So I used to listen to it. And then I came across uh, many good preachers that I heard of. And then I started buying their books, right? And I started reading these books. And it became so interesting to me that I used to read and read and read. Now, I had to develop that habit. It didn't come on its own. It's not like I became a believer. Okay, give me the Bible. Let me read. No. You had, I had to develop it. The same way, when you look at the spiritual aspect, right? Um, when it comes to any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, prophecy, word of knowledge, healing and deliverance, the gift of faith, all of these, praying in tongues, all of these, I had to develop it. And if you and I are in the ministry, we have to develop ourselves in the supernatural. We have to grow in the supernatural. So what do I have to do in the natural? Go back. Go back to God's word. And then eventually you'll begin to step into the supernatural. It may look or you may feel weird. You may feel strange. Oh, this, you know, or sometimes you may feel that it's not, you know, it's not making sense. That's all right. When you're when you learn to ride a cycle, what happens? How many of you know how to ride a cycle? All of us know. <laughs> All of us know how to ride a cycle. Did all of you ride without falling? How many times you fell? Many times. Now, if I think of it, I've fallen so many times. I've got very bad scrapes and hurts everywhere. And did I say the next day, oh, no, I don't want to ride cycle? It's boring. This. Why should I hurt myself? No, you're willing to get that hurt because, hey, I want to ride the cycle. You know that eventually you will ride the cycle. This falling will happen, but I know I will ride it. One day I will not fall. I know that I will ride the cycle. In developing the supernatural, you may fall. In fall, when I say fall, I mean you may not understand everything first. But as you step into it, as you develop it, as you grow in it, you'll begin to realize: okay, this is how I must. You know, uh, this is how I must walk in the supernatural, the gifts of the spirit, right? It could be as simple as a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. Right now, you know, you're you're ministering, and then suddenly, uh, you know, somebody comes to you and says, you know, this is a problem I'm going through. Help me. I don't know what to do in this situation. You need a word of wisdom. You can't just say, okay, you know, let me think about it. You need a word of wisdom for that moment. You know, if a parent comes up to you and says, "Hey, oh, you know, I'm going through a problem. My son or my my son is a suicidal." What will you tell? You need a word of wisdom at that time. You can't say, "Come, let's have five days of fasting prayer." That's not going to help them at that time. Or you can't say, oh, "You know, pray in tongues for one hour every day." That is, you can do, but at that moment, you need a word of wisdom. Right? Like how Jesus he brought the coin to him. Should we pay taxes? Okay. What's on the coin? Whose face is it? Jesus. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. End of story. There was no miracle. There was nothing there. It was only a word of wisdom. And so even as we you know, go out and do our ministries and, and, and step out, we need to develop ourselves in the in the supernatural. Right? It could be even teaching. It could be uh, ministering the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In every area, develop yourself in the supernatural. Remember this, something that 
I personally keep in my mind is I always keep at the back of my mind knowing that when whenever I preach or teach the word of God, I can expect the supernatural because God is a supernatural God. Now, if I don't want to, ex if I don't expect then I can't say, God, why didn't you bring healing? Why didn't you, you know, why didn't you touch people's heart? What is happening? Am I wrong? I'm not expecting it. Right? So I need to expect that. I need to expect and desire to flow in the supernatural. Everyone with me? Yes? Okay, third point. Develop the ability to present the gospel to varied audiences. Now, this is something that we've already learned about, right? So... As an evangelist, you will meet different people, different audiences, different cultures, different languages, different groups. Uh, and we must develop the ability right, to minister to these audiences. Now, for example, this is we are in a city. Uh, the most common language is English, and many of us understand English. Now, for example, we go into a village or a town where English is not the main language, but Hindi or in any other language is uh, is the main language. So I can't go there and start preaching about uh, you know all uh, end times prophecies and uh, you know the Ark of the Covenant, all those things. So I need to know what to preach where. There is a place to do apologetics. You know it's apologetics, right? It's to give a defense for the gospel. There's a place. Now I can't go to. So villages and do, hey, uh, let's do apologetics here. It's not going to work. I mean, they want to know what we're talking about. So develop the ability to present the gospel in the right place, how to do it. Now, if I'm speaking to IT professionals, I'm going to increase my level of, you know, the way I speak, right? The examples I use, it's going to be different. If I'm in a village or in a town doing ministry, examples I'm going to use is, very common to them, something that they can understand. So I must develop this ability. Right? You understand? Right? So as an evangelist or as a preacher, I must develop. I must know, okay, if I'm in this setting, this is what I must be able to preach. If I'm in this setting, this is how I should preach. Right? And the mistake we may make is sometimes we may try to, you know, uh, show or to prove to others that I know a lot. So in one sermon, we preach from Genesis to Revelation, we bring everything that we know in one sermon. That is wrong. I mean, we, must, we must know how to present the gospel in the right way. If you're talking about a topic, try to stay on that and bring a conclusion, bring an application. How will I apply it in my life? Right? This is very critical as an evangelist or as a minister of God, as a preacher. You preach a sermon, you have to end it as an application. Right? So last Sunday, what did we talk about? End times and Bible prophecy. Right? We're talking about that. So end times, how do I apply it in my life? So we have to bring an application so we can live in readiness. We know that you know there's going to be wars, there's going to be conflicts, there's going to be things that are coming up. But we can live in readiness and we have a hope that God is with us. You know, God is still in control. But we look at what's happening around us, so much of war and hatred and death that is happening. But God is still in control. God is God will uh, God's plan, God's purposes will only prevail. So you have an application. Right? So the same thing, you, know, you and I must be able to, when we present the gospel, we must also be able to present it in the right way. To the right audience, right? It should never be to you know just just so that I fill up time or just so that I can impress people, you know, just preach and teach whatever we feel like. No, the point is you must get through to people, right? So be wise in your preparation, right? Uh, the use of examples and all of that. Fourthly, maintain your passion for souls. Again, as I, as we spoke of this. As we do ministry over and over and over again, year after year, you know, ministering to people, serving the people, probably there are certain patterns or certain uh, things that are set in place. Don't lose sight of what you're doing and why you're doing. Maintain that pattern for souls. 
And I think a brilliant example would be that of the great apostle Paul. He started off in his missionary journey. The point was not to start churches. That was not in his mind. Right? The point of launching out into his missionary journey was to see lives changed and bringing people to Christ. And he himself testifies of that. Right? He says, uh, I think it is, I'm not sure what that verse is, but I think it's Corinth, in Corinthians. He says, uh, you are my crown. I, I could be, it could be Romans. But you are my crown and my glory in the presence of God. So Paul is saying, hey, it's, it's not the missionary journeys. It's not the churches that I planted that I'm going to boast about. But I'm going to boast about you. You are my crown in heaven. Right? And, and the Apostle Paul, towards the end of his life, even as he stands before Felix, what is he doing? He's not saying, you know, Felix, I did a lot of ministry. I have uh, planted churches. Even though you tried to stop me, ministry is going on, so nobody can stop me. No. He's saying, Felix, let me talk to you. And Felix himself was afraid that, you know, he begins to share the gospel with Felix. And Felix is afraid, saying, hey, Paul, stop it for now. Because uh, I don't want to listen to this now. I'll call for you later. Even to the end of his life, the Apostle Paul, for the Apostle Paul, even one soul mattered. Right? And this is a passion that we must have. We must maintain that passion for souls. We must ask God, especially over time. Now, initially, it's, it's easy. You become a believer or you, or you get into ministry, you're excited, you're pumped up, you want to do something for God, and then you're, you know, you're excited, whatever opportunity comes, you take it up. Six months down the line, slowly the energy level has dropped. One year down the line, ah, it's okay. Two years down the line, okay, I'll do what I have to do. And now five years down the line, it becomes a routine. We're doing the same thing. Again and again and again and again, and we forget, hey, I've lost the passion. I've lost my desire. Right? So never come to a place where you're dry and you feel, okay, this is what I am. Maintain a passion for souls. How do I maintain a passion for souls? I've got to maintain a passion for God. I've got to maintain a passion for God's word. Right? Now, you know, I've been desiring to learn a lot about uh, you know the ark of the covenant and i just wanted to learn more on that right uh, so I'm, I'm i'm just trying to just read more on it try to understand more of it right uh, sorry yeah try to do a, some research and uh, you know i've I, i'm trying to do a project on my own right uh, i i'm the teacher i'm only the student so i've given myself a project so i want to do that why, why am I doing it? Because, see, I can, I can come to a place <clears throat> of just doing what I'm doing. Monday, three hours. Tuesday, three hours. Supernatural hour. Go back to office. Wednesday, go to office. Thursday, go to office. Friday, three hours. Go to office. Go home. It can become a routine. Right? Now, we've been preaching this for more than 10 years. I can share. I have a lot of examples I can share. But if I don't have a passion for it, I will lose sight of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Right? Topics like faith and all these other topics we've been teaching. All of us have been teaching for more than 10 years. But we need to develop and maintain that passion. Hey, Today is my lecture. I need to go. I need to prepare myself. I need to speak this. These are some of the things I want to share. Um, you know, uh, th that's what stirs us up. Now, it doesn't come automatically. I have to go back to God's word. I have to go back to God's presence. I have to go back to God and say, God, give me the passion. Give me the desire. Now, these are seeds that we are sowing in people's heart. We don't know what's going to happen, what they're going to do next. You guys may go and do you know great ministries later on, but we're just sowing the seed, Lord. You know, somebody else may water it, but you make it grow. But I need to develop that. I need to maintain that passion for souls. I can't be in a position and say it's been 10 years now, so I'll just come teach and go. That's a wrong place to be. Right? 
I need to develop. I need to maintain a passion. I need to fan it into flame, right? So don't lose sight of the bigger picture that you're doing. Um, it could be just ministering to 10 people in a church or ministering to thousands of people. Bigger picture is you maintain passion for souls, right? Fifthly, learn how to equip the saints for similar kind of ministry. We, we saw this model and we talked a lot about it. As a believer, as a minister of God, our number one priority is to make disciples. Don't make replicates or replicas of who you are. That means don't make people who will follow you. Make disciples of Jesus. Right? Make disciples uh, uh, or who can, uh, you know, equip disciples who can do the work of the ministry in the right way. Right? And of course, now we have a lot of um, discipleship programs, training sessions, seminars. Equip people, right? Share what you know. Share how you can. What has worked for you? What has not worked for you? Share things that uh, you feel can help another person, right? Maybe in their ministry or in their work, in anything they're doing. Equip people to do this kind of ministry. When you look at the evangelist, we started off in uh, the first chapter. He says it is for everyone. Everyone are called to evangelize. Everyone are called to speak and minister to people, right? So equip people to do that. Sixthly, just a few things here. When ministering to a local church, number one, submit to the leadership of the local church. Now, there will be times, uh, you know, you may be invited to another church, local church. If the pastor tells you 30 minutes, do 30 minutes. Don't say, Pastor, I want to do one hour. Submit to the leadership. If the pastor is saying, uh, you know, we normally have worship, then offering, then uh, communion, then wo word. Now you don't say, no, no, no. We'll change that order. We'll have worship, then I will come preach for one hour, then we'll have communion. No. We are called to submit. See, we will come preach and go. But this person has to handle the church, right? He's a pastor of the church. He has to handle so, so we must be very careful. Submit to the local pastor. Be sensitive to the local church order. Now, there will be times you may be invited to local churches where you may not agree to everything that they do. You may not agree to everything that they are following. I've been invited to places where I don't agree to a lot of things. I've been uh, invited to a couple of churches where they don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Right now, I need to be, have integrity. I need to know. Okay, now they don't believe in it. They are still at a certain level, or, or they still don't have that revelation. So let me. It's not like I'm agreeing to what they believe in, but I'm I'm trying to you know honor them. I don't want to disrespect them. So I'm going to talk about a sermon on faith, or talk about you know. Uh, Biblical principles on um, on growing in God's word. I don't purposely take gifts of the Holy Spirit topic and preach. Right? You get what I'm saying, right? So you you be sensitive to the local church. Now, sometimes you may be uh, invited to a mainline church, and there's you know hierarchy and all of that. Now, don't go talking about all of that. That is not what. People have invited you to do. You've been invited to preach the gospel. You preach the gospel. Right. Share the share the word. Right. Remember, I always think of this. You shall know the truth. That's what Jesus said, right? They shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Instead of pointing fingers at people saying this is wrong, what we can do is bring the truth. You know, there's a there's a book, and I read this book, uh, very famous book by Dr. Ravi Zacharias, and he writes that there's no point of cutting off somebody's nose and giving them a rose to smell. Say that again. There's no point of cutting off somebody's nose and then giving them a rose to smell. 
basically saying you know what this church this church y'all don't believe in the gifts of the holy spirit but the bible says that so you know i think somewhere you have missed the mark um it's important that you each one of us must flow in the gifts of the spirit so now i'm going to preach in the next 15 minutes about the gifts of the spirit and uh, i pray that the holy spirit will minister to you now what's happened i've cut off their nose firstly and then i'm giving them a rose to smell. see gifts of the holy spirit very nice it is it's happened I've not acted wisely, right? Be sensitive, especially when you're ministering to other churches and other in, in other ministries. Lastly, be connected to a local church. And this we have uh, established also the fact that uh, as evangelists, as you grow in your ministries or um, wherever God is calling you for, of course, itinerant ministries, traveling from place to place, um, but it's very important to be committed to a local church, be committed to tithing to a local church, serve in the local church whenever you can. Don't, you know, we don't, we are not to put ourselves on a pedestal and say, hey, I'm the evangelist where, you know, thousands of people come when I preach. But this church is only uh, 300 people in the church. If that is, if you are part of that church, that's your local church, be faithful there. Now, don't go to the pastor and say, pastor, we should do something. See, when I preach, why thousands are coming? But uh, as a local church, we are still 300 people. You don't have to do all of that. They are different gifts. They are different callings. And God will handle that. Our responsibility is to be faithful to the local church. Instead, what I can do is say, Pastor, I went to these countries. I've got some material. So can we? Can I share it with you? Uh, you can, if you'd like, you can go through it, share it with the church. right? Or these are CDs that I've got, some material that you can share with the church. That, that way you're building the church, right? So let's use these practical steps, these practical guidelines. Ministry is also about being wise. We need to be wise in the way we do ministry, right? So this combination of the supernatural and the natural, you put it together. And I'm sure when we do that, our ministries will definitely be very effective. So any questions? All right. So next class, we'll get into the next aspect, which is the ministry of the teacher. And then we'll look at various, various different, uh, uh, you know, uh, aspects of the ministry of the teacher from next class. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good day. I'll see you soon.